I was going to uh, do my, my talk originally, and then it got very long. And I said to Keith, it's getting very long. Uh, and I was getting worried about that. I thought, there's no way I'm going to squeeze this into 20 minutes. And so we agreed that I kind of do it in two parts, and then other things took over. So I'll start by just... Um, thank you. I'll start by just refreshing your memory uh, about what I said originally in my first uh, part. And if you haven't heard the first part, uh, I'd uh, recommend listening to it just to get the context of what I'm going to talk about this week. And um, the context was our week of prayer and fasting, which was terrific. And God spoke to us in many ways, various ways. Uh, He spoke to me particularly uh, whilst we were at Cobham. And during the time of worship at Cobham, I saw before me what looked like static electricity. And as I said previously, that anyone who's familiar, who's old enough to remember a CRT TV, I see Steve Gawthrop nodding, um, will know what static electricity on a screen looks like. It's this horrible kind of fuzzy mess. And I couldn't understand what that was, but as it moved back, it became like boiling water. So it was like my eyes were against boiling water. And then it carried on moving back, and it became a pot of boiling water on my stove. And then God said to me, a pot of cold water is of no use at all, so I'm going to heat you up. And, yeah, I I kind of sniggered as well because I thought, what does that mean? I knew that it applied to me, most certainly, but I also felt that it applied to us in some way. And I then sought the Lord about it because I wasn't sure what it meant at first. God gave me two particular scriptures in relation to it at the time, but I couldn't decide which one was the right one or whether there was a right one. It was like I had one scripture sitting on my left shoulder talking to me and another on my right talking to me. And so I went to Michelle after the meeting and I said, I think God has spoken to me, but I'm not sure how to interpret it, so I'm not going to give it yet. And then to cut a long story short, I met a friend, shared the thing with him, and he said, no, they they both actually fit together, although I still couldn't quite understand how. And the first part of the vision that I had, uh, the scripture was from Revelation 5. And in that part of Revelation, the book of Revelation, Jesus is dictating letters to seven churches in Asia Minor. And each one of the churches has a different characteristic Some of the churches are going through extremely tough times. They're under severe persecution. Some of the churches are finding it a bit easier. In particular, the Lord spoke to me about the church of Laodicea. And Jesus had some pretty stern things to say to the church in Laodicea. The background to that church, I won't go into detail, and I'll point you to my previous talk on it, but basically, Laodicea was a pretty wealthy place. The church was full of money, and they were feeling pretty self-satisfied. Like, what they really needed, they'd already got. They didn't need anything from God, because they got all this money, and they could do anything they liked. And Jesus took issue with them about that. And he said, you're lukewarm. And because you're lukewarm, because you're neither cold nor boiling hot, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And that was quite an interesting word. The second part of my talk comes from the book of Jeremiah. And 
At the start of Jeremiah 1, God calls him. Jeremiah doesn't really feel up to it and says to God, I'm just too young for this kind of thing. But God says, you're the guy for the job. And the first part of verses 1 to 12 are not so relevant to what I felt God was saying to us. So I'm kind of skipping over that. But in the second part, I'll read to you. The word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a pot that's boiling, I answered. It's tilting towards us from the north. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. I am about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdoms, declares the Lord. Their kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. They will come against all her surrounding walls and against all the towns of Judah. I will pronounce my judgments on my people because of their wickedness in forsaking me, in burning incense to other gods, and in worshipping what their hands have made. Get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them, whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them, or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you. And will rescue you, declares the Lord. Now, I'm not going to undertake an exposition of the whole section. I just want to draw out some salient things that I think are relevant and tie into the previous word that I gave. And what I have to say won't necessarily map onto the whole of this passage. Now, what was Israel called to be? This is where Michelle stole my thunder without realizing it earlier on. That's quite all right. It's good. Israel was called to be a nation of priests. That's what God called them to be in Exodus 19, verse 6. He said, you are going to be a nation of priests. What do priests do? For Israel, the priests were called to reflect God's character through living out a coherent, integrated, covenant lifestyle. In this picture, what do the gates and the walls of Jerusalem signify? Well, for us, we think of gates, and we perhaps think of just they're useful to stop things coming in, going out, and we just pass through them. But in those times... The gates were very, very significant to the city. Of course, they provided security for the people inside the city, but there was something more to it than that. The gates were the place where the leaders would make decisions. People would gather at the gates and do business. They would have serious discussions at the gates. The gates represented something. And you'll see throughout the Old Testament, the gates and the walls represent something very significant. So, in our case, how do we represent the gates? What do the gates mean in the context of what I'm talking about? I think the gates here are the full, unabridged, unabashed, unashamed gospel of Christ. Those that, is, that represents the gates for us. The gates are the place where we derive our security. The gates are the place where we derive the knowledge of our identity. Just as the gates of the city define the city, the gates for us, the gospel, defines us. Our identity is found in Christ. The gates, for me, are the gospel. Well, if the gates are the gospel, unabashed, the truth of the gospel... What do the kings of the north represent? 
And I was chewing on this for a long time and asking the Lord, what do these things represent? And I think that the kings of the north in our context, the context of this word, represent ideas and ideologies that that set themselves up against the gospel. They set their thrones up. Notice the kings of the north come in the passage of Jeremiah. They come to the gates. They set their thrones up at the entrance to the gates of Jerusalem. That's very significant for us, I think, as a church. It represents, for Jerusalem, it represents the usurpation of authority. It represents being supplanted. It represents authority being taken away and being exercised by those outside the city, those who are coming against the city of Jerusalem. And for us, it represents, in the context of this word, the ideas and ideologies that come against the gospel, the ideas and ideologies in our culture and in our society that come against living an authentic Christian life that is integrated, full, and covenant-based. Now, I'm not going to reel off all those things because later on I've got a question for you about those and I'd like us to explore those together. Some of those ideas may be very obvious because they're explicitly anti-Christian, explicitly oppose the gospel. Others of those ideas and ideologies may borrow parts of Christian belief and import them, and yet others may simply rely on the idea of some definition of love or tolerance. But as I thought about this, one of the things that struck me was that there is perhaps a greater threat to the church today. And that's the threat of nominal Christianity. We live in quite a privileged, we think we live in a privileged situation. We're not generally under persecution. The history of the church is the history of persecution. And the church has flourished through persecution of various kinds. And the danger of living in times when there's no persecution is nominal Christianity. And how do we define what nominal Christianity is? Fortunately for us, the Bible gives us the answer. The Apostle Paul provides a really good working definition, I think, in the second letter to Timothy where he warns Timothy to watch out for people who have a form of godliness but denying its power. That's interesting, a form of godliness but denying its power. What does that mean? I think it means that outwardly there's this vaguely moral, somewhat ethical exterior to someone's life, but they don't believe in the power of the gospel to change them or anything. We're not called as Christians to live vaguely ethical, moral lives. Our lives are based on a dynamic relationship with the living God. That is a relationship that has the power to change. The power to change us, the power to change the world around us. But there is plenty going on out there which is nominal. And I think one of the things that we need to learn to do in order to tackle that is to exercise judgment. Now, judgment is a really tricky word, I think. It's a word that's got bad press. 
I think it gets interpreted very negatively. But when you read the Scriptures, God's judgment brings freedom. God's judgment brings revelation, it brings reconciliation, it brings clarity, it brings hope. So judgment is actually a very good thing in the, as far as the scriptures are concerned, I think. But it's often thought of as in a very negative light. We say, oh, we mustn't judge, we mustn't judge. But when you read the scriptures, you'd be surprised that that isn't how the Bible sees it, I think. And that's the challenge for us. How do we do that? In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul is writing to a church that's struggling. It's a church that's full of people who've come out of exotic places of pagan worship, where they've done stuff that we'd probably find pretty shocking, and it's been pretty normal to them to do that thing. And they're struggling to make a connection between what they profess as their faith and what they exercise as their lifestyle. And to some degree, we all have that struggle. We all struggle to make a firm connection between what we profess as our faith and how we live, the decisions that we make. But for the Corinthians, it was pretty blatant. It's actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you in a kind that even the pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife, and you're proud? Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? For my part, even though I'm not physically present, I'm with you in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way... I've already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who has been doing this. So when you are assembled, and I'm with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy, or swindlers, or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave this world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral, or greedy, an idolater, or slanderer, a drunkard, or a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. This is a very tough passage. But it's right there in black and white. And all I want to say is that this is a pretty extreme example of nominal Christianity. Somebody here is so disconnected between what they profess to believe and the way they're living And this person needed that pointing out. This person, for their own sake, for their own salvation, for their own well-being, needed to have that pointed out. It was not a godly thing to allow it to continue. I think the scripture, in short, expects us to hold one another to account. It's a tough ask, that is, very difficult. I think it's hard if we don't have a relationship with each other that can bear that kind of weight. So what that means, I think, is that we have to forge those kind of relationships that bear that kind of weight because you can't drive a two-ton truck over a one-ton bridge and hope to get to the other side. 
Our job as a body is to help one another through our struggles. Christianity is not a solitary exercise. We're called together as a body. We have to exercise judgment. We have to do it in a godly, loving, Jesus-focused way. We have to figure out how to do that. We can't shy away from it. And what about me, personally? What about you, personally? How do we ensure that our faith is more than nominal? Again, the Bible gives us the answer to this. At the end of Paul's second letter to the Corinthian church, he invites the church to reflect on the nature of their own relationship with God. He says, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. And I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Now we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong. Not so that people will see that we have stood the test, but so that you will do what is right, even though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We're glad when we're weak, but you are strong. And our prayer is that you may be fully restored. This is why I write these things when I'm absent, that when I come, I may not have to be harsh in the use of my authority, the authority the Lord gave me for building you up, not for tearing you down. So we're invited to test ourselves as well, regularly. What does that mean? Again, got some questions for you there. So, concluding drawing these together, these things together, we are at a time when I think the kings are at the gates. Our culture and our society are already moving to put things in place which will make it very challenging to live an authentic Christian lifestyle in the UK. And I don't think it's going to get easier. Persecution comes in many forms. There are ideas out there that are presented as tolerant, and we will be the bigots. Now, I don't have a problem with being called a bigot. The difficulty is that it becomes difficult to share the gospel with people who think that you're a bigot. This is one of the great challenges, I think, that we're going to face as Christians in our Western, very liberal, secular democracy. We need to figure out how we can live an authentic Christian lifestyle to honor God in everything that we do and present the gospel under that kind of persecution. I think the word that I received for me personally is a warning to remain hot, boiling hot. I can't slip into nominal Christianity. I have to test myself constantly. I need to put myself at the disposal of others whose opinions and insights I value and trust so that they'll speak into my life. I need to hear the truth. When I'm going wrong, I need to be corrected. We all need that. We have to develop those kind of relationships because at the end of the day, this isn't a game. This is an existential issue for us. We can't play at church. So we have to be transformed by God and transformed through the love and grace that we give one another.